All right, folks. So I am delighted to introduce Olivia Waring, who is a PhD student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and she's going to be talking to us about recording today. So take it away, Olivia. Thank you so much, Anna. It's just great to be here. Um, I'm very, very excited to be presenting to you today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen, um, and we'll get started. Give it one second. Share. Hopefully, you can see a periodic table. Is that <laughs> is that what you can see? Amazing. Um, and then we'll go ahead and start the slideshow. All good here. Thumbs up. See, can see me, hear me. Perfect. Um, Welcome everybody. It is great to have you here for this uh, webinar on audio and video recording, specifically for language documentation and revitalization. As Anna mentioned, I'm Olivia. Um, I am a PhD student at UH Manoa. Um, so this is me and I currently live here um, in beautiful Hawaii. Um, I also do some research on a language spoken in Alaska, the EAC language, which is right over here and the Tiwa language, um, which is spoken in Assam. So those are, India and Alaska are, uh, are my two, two uh, spots in the world where I do my research. Um, but let's get started with audio recording first. Um, so there are so many reasons that one might create a recording of linguistic data. Um, a, a theoretical linguist perhaps, or a documentary linguist is interested in linguistic analysis, finding things out about how the language works. Um, of course, from a more applied perspective, you have teachers that want to create pedagogical resources for a language. And preservation, being able to look back um, on recordings of legends, folk tales, poems, songs, all that sort of thing. So numerous reasons for making a recording. Um, oops. In terms of choosing a recording environment, uh, oftentimes you can't control for your environment. You do the best that you can. Um, sometimes the circumstances are less than ideal and that's perfectly all right, but you want to try optimizing your setting um, to, to uh, optimize the quality of your recording. And that includes trying to minimize background noise. Um, and what's funny is oftentimes you might not perceive background noise in your particular environment uh, as you're just existing in it. But then when you listen back to the recording, suddenly you can you can really hear the sound of the fridge, for example. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty common one that crops up in recordings. Um, so just to give you a, a sort of indication of things that might be more audible than you expect um, uh, after the fact. Fans, uh, kids, animals, background chatter, um, cell phones beeping and, and ringing. Um, yeah, electrical appliances, fridges um, tend to, to have this sort of low rumble that you can often detect in, in audio recordings. Snacks. Um, sometimes people are, are prone to tapping the table or, or you know, clicking a pen. That can happen. Uh, traffic noises. Again, not all of these are avoidable, and that is perfectly fine. You just want to be sort of aware of the different factors that play into your recording quality. Um, so in terms of an ideal recording environment, um, indoors is best, and you're ideally going to create for yourself what's known as a soft room. When you're surrounded by a lot of hard surfaces, um, sound waves can sort of bounce back and forth off those hard surfaces, leading to echo, which is never a good thing in a recording. Uh, so you're going to want to dampen those echoes by um, having a soft surrounding. If you've ever been to a recording studio, you'll notice they have a lot of foam on their walls. You can recreate this effect in your own home with towels, blankets, even egg cartons. Some people um, like to record in, in closets or even in their car. That tends to create uh, a nice ambiance for sound. Um, best if the windows are closed. Um, I live here in Hawaii right now. I'm in my room and it is, there's the gorgeous sound of bird song uh, and we love birds, but they can interfere with your language data. Same with fans and appliances. Kids, kids are amazing, sometimes a little noisy. So, um, you know, try to uh, try to ask them to, uh, to maybe go play in another area if you can. Um, just all sorts of things to think about as you're, as you're crafting your, your perfect environment. And it's best if possible um, to minimize the number of people 
um, that are that are occupying the room with you and the space with you. Um, of course, you know, not to the uh, to the extent that you compromise any of the language data. It's wonderful to have a lot of people in a setting talking with one another, chatting and conversing and sharing knowledge. Um, but just just something to think about. Um, let's talk a little bit about audio recording equipment. So I've shown here three pictures of sort of your typical dedicated audio recorder. Um, we've got a Tascam here. That's a that's a common brand. A Zoom recorder as well is something that you'll encounter quite a bit in the field. These tend to run about two hundred U.S. dollars, um, although you can certainly find find some for less. Um, they run on batteries, which is great. Um, they don't, uh, you know, kind of have that electronic rumbling sound. And they have built-in microphones, um, but you can also equip them with external microphones that can allow you to sort of tailor uh, the sounds that you're capturing. And to that end, I want to talk to you about um, the different types of microphones. Um, but first, let me let me sort of address why you might not wish to record just with your phone or with the um, the innate capability of your of your computer, for example, to uh, to make a recording. Um, computers and phones are equipped with uh, with inbuilt software to filter certain frequencies. They also are designed to remove background noise. And I put remove in quotes um, because uh, while removing background noise is is a great capability, um, it's better to do that in post-production so that you're not inadvertently removing anything that's actually useful um, to your recording. So you don't wanna do that upfront. Um, and computers themselves create background noise. Um, I have an old computer that I'm presenting from right now, and you probably can't hear it, but it is whirring like a jet engine about to take off. So that's, you know, <laughs> that's never a sound that you want in your recordings per se. Um, and so if you are recording with a phone or a computer, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, um, you can get exponentially better audio by, um, attaching an external microphone. So let's talk about what those look like. Um, we've got, uh, oh, sorry, my sorry. skipping slides here, types slides of here, microphones. Types of microphones. Um, um, these are sort of three sort basic of types. Three basic. Um, you have your shotgun microphone, uh, which you might recognize from seeing movie sets, right? This is the kind of microphone that people hold up above the actors um, as, they're, as they're performing a scene. Your typical handheld mic, um, which you'll see at, at concerts or, um, or other big events. And then a lapel mic or a lavalier mic, a lav mic, um, which pins onto your clothing um, right around here so that it picks up sound as you speak. Um, this is very tragic, so uh, a tragically chosen name, unfortunately. Um, so oftentimes as you're speaking, um, the P's and T's and other plosive sounds will, will create a popping effect in the recording. And you want to minimize that. And the way to do that is to use a foam windscreen, which has very unfortunately acquired the name Dead Cat uh, in, the, in the audio recording industry. Um, because I suppose because it's sort of like fluffy and, and limp, I'm not sure, but very unfortunate for, uh, for all the cats out there. Um, but that will be very helpful for you in terms of minimizing those, those unpleasant popping sounds. You can see one of those foam windscreens right here on that shotgun mic. Um, microphone directionality is another thing that you're going to want to think about. Um, so microphones come in a, in a variety of, of different forms and pick up different types of sounds. Um, so a unidirectional microphone is going to pick up sounds in one direction only. So we've got, I've got two examples for you here. Um, this darker outline tells you sort of where around the microphone that sound is going to be picked up. Um, so you have your cardioid shape here, cardioid because it's kind of a heart shape, I guess you could say. And if you have your microphone situated right in the middle here, that's going to pick up sound from this area right in front of the microphone. A supercardioid um, uh, polar pattern, that's another word for this directionality, is again going to pick up things right in front of the microphone with, with sort of a, a narrower angle. So if you really want to capture just one person, let's say, and sort of eliminate all the noise um, that's from the surroundings, that's a great choice. 
Um, an omnidirectional microphone, as you can see over here, has a spherical polar pattern, so it picks up noise equally from everywhere around the speaker. And that's great if perhaps you have a, a conversational setting, you place the microphone right in the middle of your interlocutors and everyone is chatting around and all of their voices get picked up equally. Um, and finally, a bi-directional microphone picks up sound directly in front of the microphone and directly behind the microphone. So this is a great choice if, for example, you're conducting an interview um, and you have two folks that you want to pick up their voices, um, but ignore some of the surrounding sound from the sides. Um, seems to be skipping for me. Sorry about that. Um, so we did mention before that recording from a phone is um, is a great idea, a very viable option, um, particularly if you're going to attach an external mic. Things you want to keep in mind while doing this is you want to position either the phone itself or the microphone about four to six inches away from the speaker. Um, best practice is to make a practice recording um, and then listen to it with your headphones to make sure that everything is sounding as it should, that you've positioned the microphone properly, that you've minimized background noise. Um, I would not use headphones while you're actually recording because that can have uh, some unintended side effects, some unintended consequences, changing the settings of your recording. So use the headphones to test uh, a practice recording, but otherwise keep them uh, keep them away from your phone. Um, the phone should be placed on a, a soft and level, stable surface. You want to avoid the phone rattling around while you're recording. Um, and if possible, elevate the phone so that it is level with the speaker's mouth or the microphone is level with the speaker's mouth. And put it in airplane mode um, so that it doesn't, you don't get any any surprise calls or texts uh, while you're while you're in the midst of your recording. It's very important to check your sound levels um, when you're conducting audio recordings. Unfortunately, once you've finished a recording and you're listening back, if it's too quiet or too loud, uh, both of those can can really be devastating for recording quality. Certainly not insurmountable. There are there are ways you can fix uh, fix each of those problems, but um, better to to nip them in the bud beforehand. Um, so with your traditional audio recorder, the Tascam or the Zoom that I showed you before, um, the way you'll do this is you will press the record button once and the record light should start blinking. So it hasn't started to record yet, but it's kind of the preliminary phase. So this is the point at which you're gonna wanna check your, your levels. Um, there will be a knob nearby, um, and this is going to vary from recording device to recording device, so you'll want to check your manual, but there'll be a little knob that allows you to adjust what we call the gain. Um, and so I've, I've pasted in some, some images here. Um, you're going to ask your speaker to start saying some test sentences, and as that happens, these little green bars are going to sort of jump up and down in response to the speaker's voice. So when they speak louder, those bars are going to uh, extend higher uh, along along this axis. Um, and when they're softer, they're going to they're going to go down a little bit. And so your goal is to have the green bars be as high as they can be without what we call clipping. So uh, if the green bars go off this scale, you'll see that they'll start turning yellow and then orange and then red. Um, and that's called clipping. That means we've basically exceeded the recorder's capacity to uh, to capture that sound. So you want your um, your recording levels to be as high and as green as they can possibly be. Um, extending into the yellow is OK, um, but you want to make sure you're avoiding that orange and that red space. Uh, so have your have your speaker try talking at a lot of different volumes. Um, and adjust that knob to make sure that even at the very loudest, you're not extending into the red range. Um, basic recording procedure. Um, so with your recording device, whether it be an external um, handheld audio recorder or your phone or your computer, you're gonna wanna access your settings. Um, and again, consult your manual. It'll be different for each individual device. Um, but the best settings for um, audio recording are uh, 
44.1 kilohertz sampling speed. And this is the, um, the same sampling rate as your typical audio CD. So any CD that you play in your car, which has great audio quality and is professionally produced, um, that's the same quality that you'll achieve on your own recording device uh, with 44.1 kilohertz or 16 bits. Um, and you can save your audio in multiple different formats, um, but a, a dot .wave file is, uh, is probably your best option because this is what we call a lossless format. Um, and it's gonna be a big file because it's not gonna try to compress any of, uh, of your audio or, or try to make the file smaller by you know, deleting certain, uh, certain aspects and portions of your audio. So this is really a, a high fidelity um, file type that that preserves every every aspect of the recording. Um, so you're going to want to use that. As I mentioned before, you'll hit that record button once. You're going to go ahead and you test your audio levels. Make sure you're not clipping. There's no uh, there's no red space up there. Um, you're going to adjust the gain for that Goldilocks level of sound. Right, not too loud, not too soft. Right in the middle there. Press record to begin again, and then you're off to the races. It is very good practice um, to record 30 seconds of comparative silence. Um, so, and again, this might capture some background noise, some buzzing of your refrigerator or, you know, some bird song, things in the background. This is called the room tone. So what you're doing here is no one is speaking. You're just capturing uh, the organic ambient sounds of the room. And that can be really helpful later in post-processing if you want to sort of subtract those sounds out of the final recording. Um, so that's audio recording. Do we have any questions before we begin our section on video recording? Any, any pressing questions? Or maybe we'll defer them all to the end uh, and I'll just carry on here um, with video recording. So why, why do we bother to make video recordings instead of just relying on audio? As I'm sure you, you all are linguists here and, and language practitioners, you know that language is a lot more than just audio, a lot more than just spoken speech. Um, languages that are spoken as their modality um, make extensive use of facial expressions and gestures. For example, if um, I as a speaker want to refer to something that's close to me, I'll say this, something that's far, I might say that. Um, and all of that is valuable data that can be collected about a language. Of course, sign languages, right? Which I feel often get short shrift when we're talking about language documentation, but are so, so important. Um, they are, it's crucial to, to capture video recordings of sign languages. Um, video recordings allow us to see the language used in context, to see the discourse context, uh, to see facial expressions, um, and to see the manner in which speakers interact with one another, all of which is useful data. And they provide a really dynamic resource for language communities. So for example, if you're, if you're making a video of someone um, uh, showing a, a traditional craft or you know, perhaps making a, 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 showing the weaving of a fishnet, you wanna be able to actually see that as it's being described. And that's just a really valuable cultural artifact um, and pedagogical tool. Of course, everything, uh, you know, there's other sides of the coin. So video has its downsides. It's very expensive to acquire professional video recording equipment. Um, and it does result in much larger file sizes, right? You're capturing more and more dynamic data. Um, video recording sometimes is distracting for participants. It can be a little a little freaky to have a, a video camera trained on you, right? It's it's hard to um, it's hard to ignore that presence when it's just an audio recorder sitting next to you. Sometimes you can just kind of forget that it's there, but a video recorder is a little bit harder to put out of your mind. Um, so this can result in you know speakers being very aware of, of where they are, what they're saying, what they're doing, um, and after you've you've collected your video footage, it often requires um, different expensive softwares to fully utilize and edit. And we're gonna try to circumvent some of those issues um, as we talk today about different possibilities. Um, but first, let's just talk about the mechanics of video recording. 
So when you record video, you want to position that camera ever so slightly above the speaker or right at their eye level. Um, you certainly don't want it to be coming from below. So ideally a little bit above and pointing downwards. Um, and if you are going to attach an external microphone, you're going to situate that just above the camera. Typically what we'll do in a language documentation context is have a video recorder going. That video recorder has a built-in microphone, which will also be collecting the audio. But then you'll also, for, for you know, extra bang for your buck, you're gonna have an external audio recorder going at the same time. So what you'll eventually end up with is one video file and two audio files one from the video camera and one from the dedicated audio recorder. Um, and it's it's always great to have redundancy in your recordings. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what it means to align those um, in just a bit. When you're setting up your, uh, your shot, your video, um, you are going to wanna keep a few principles in mind about framing. Um, make sure that your video camera is quite stably situated. And so often that will involve using a tripod uh, to make sure that it's it's very level, very steady. Um, and wide shots are best. You're not gonna wanna zoom in too close on the speaker's face. Um, you wanna include their upper bodies and you, you're gonna wanna test before you start video, video recording um, that there's sufficient space around the speakers for them to extend their arms in all directions. So my framing is not great right now in the Zoom screen because you can't see um, everything that I'm doing if I, if I wave my arms around. The reason that you want to have that little bit of extra space around your speakers is, you know, perhaps they are like me and they gesture very broadly. Um, you want to make sure none of that data is, is left uncaptured um, at the end of your recording. It would really be a shame to get back from your recording session and realize that, that you lost certain, certain aspects of the conversation. You'll use your camera to adjust the focus. Doesn't need to be fancy. Oftentimes cameras have a, an autofocus feature, which is perfectly fine for these circumstances. Um, and again, you'll, you'll want to avoid um, kind of fiddling with the camera during the recording. You're probably not gonna wanna zoom in and out or move the camera around. Really steady, stable, simple um, is what you're going for with your video recordings. Um, so here's some examples of bad framing. So you have your, your subject just kind of out of the shot, sort of halfway out. This framing is coming from a little bit too high up, right? You're going to want to have it be a little bit more level with the speaker's face. Um, and over here, again, she's a little bit um, too far to the right of the frame. Um, here's some good framing, right? Very level with the speaker's face. Lots of space around uh, the speaker for her to gesture. Um, Good framing here for uh, a pair of speakers. Now you'll notice in this case, um, there's not as much room around the speakers. You, you kind of have to optimize for um, being close enough to capture all of their facial expressions and being far enough away to capture all of the gestures. It's a, it's a little bit of an art um, and, and you can make that judgment call as to what seems best, but this would be, this would be a very good example of framing. Lighting is another consideration. Uh, you'll want to avoid filming in backlit settings. Um, so right now I'm sitting in front of a window which casts some nice light um, right on my face. If I were if I were facing away from the window, if the window were behind me, you would just see my silhouette. So that's something that you're going to want to avoid. Um, oftentimes, you know, you might be in an indoor space uh, with lots of lamps try to avoid uh, any lights that cast shadows. So you're gonna wanna try to assess for, um, for that before you start recording. Shadows tend to uh, decrease the quality of your video. You will wanna make use of any lighting sources that you have to illuminate the subject's face and torso. That's, that's really the target of the video. Um, if you do know in advance that you're gonna be shooting in a low light setting, uh, you can choose your camera accordingly. There are cameras out there that are optimized for low light settings. Um, they have they have a, a wider lens and they capture at a different frame rate. So those, uh, those can be very useful if that's something you know ahead of time. Um, otherwise, it's a great idea to try to record on an overcast day or in the late afternoon. Those tend to be sort of soft lighting settings. Uh, um, and another thing you're going to want to think about is what's called the white balance. If you've ever seen a video where the, the subject's um, 
Coloring seems a little bit strange. Maybe they appear a little orangish. There's something that seems to be off. That means the camera wasn't properly calibrated in terms of color. And the way you can fix this is by holding up a white object. You're gonna typically wanna use a piece of white fabric because you don't want anything too glossy. Um, and just double check that in the video, it shows up as a, as a pure white color. Um, if it shows up as orange or green or something else, you're gonna wanna go into your color settings and, and adjust just to make sure that everything is, is, is true to life um, in your final recording. Some examples of bad lighting, oh, that would be a shame. Uh, you have this beautiful video of a speaker doing something wonderful and then you're unable to see their facial expressions. You wanna avoid that. Um, here's some good lighting, right? It's, it's, it's soft, shadows are minimized, um, the, the faces are fully lit. Um, oops. All right, so one of the things that you're going to have to do after you uh, finish recording both your audio and your video is you're gonna have to synchronize those two files. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's very good practice to have a video camera going, which is also recording audio and then have a separate audio recording device. That can be your phone or it can be an external audio recorder. This is really useful in cases where um, the camera is situated a little further back from the speakers in order to capture the whole scene, but you want that audio recorder to be closer so that it captures their voice more directly. Um, also video camera, uh, mics, the inbuilt microphones tend to be omnidirectional, if you remember talking about those polar patterns. So they tend to capture all of the sound and you might want a more focused sound for your audio track. So that's another reason to use a dedicated audio recorder and then use the camera audio as backup. Never bad to have backup. Um, and so in order to synchronize all these different recordings that are going on, you're gonna get in touch with your inner movie star. You're gonna do what we call slating your audio. Um, and if you've ever watched uh, an old timey film being made, you'll have seen those, those little um, chalkboards with, the, with the, uh, the, the piece of wood that you hit. I'll show you a picture in the next page. But what they're doing is they're, is they're slating their audio. And you can do this too by just clapping three times um, two or three times in front of the video camera. So you wanna make sure that your hands are visible in the shot clapping, and that'll also generate this really sharp um, spike of sound. And what that lets you do is um, in post-production, it allows you to synchronize those files. So here's that, that sort of uh, slating device that you'll see um, directors using. And as you're syncing your audio files, every time you, you clap, you'll see this really tight, narrow spike of sound in the waveform. And it's really nice to see those because that allows you to kind of very beautifully align um, the audio files from separate recordings. And you can also align that with your video recording because you'll be able to see the moment at which your hands come together and that corresponds to the spike of sound. Um, so it's just a kind of a quick and uh, cheap trick for, for aligning your um, recordings. You can also use software to do this. Um, tends to be a little bit expensive, uh, a little bit uh, memory intensive. So this is a, a really quick way to do this. Um, oops, my apologies. Here. Um, okay, so let's talk about a, a recording checklist very quickly. Um, so as you're setting up your recording equipment, you're first going to think about the location as we discussed way early on in the presentation. Is this gonna give me good audio? Is it a soft space without any hard surfaces for the sound to bounce off of? Is there enough light? Are external sounds and noises minimized? Then you're gonna set up your dedicated audio recorder and ideally your external microphone. And you're gonna think about these questions of polarity um, are the mics picking up all the voices that I want to hear? Have I chosen a mic that's, that focuses on one voice or that picks up many voices? You're gonna go ahead and you're gonna check those levels, right? To make sure that even at the loudest possible levels, your speaker isn't, um, isn't clipping, the audio isn't going into that red zone. You're gonna then situate your camera on a nice steady tripod. You're gonna make sure that it's level with the speaker's faces, pointing slightly downwards. Everyone's in frame, gestures are able to be captured. 
You'll check that white balance to make sure the coloring is true to life. Um, lighting, you don't want to be backlit. You want speaker spaces illuminated. Check the gain levels and the volume on the camera's inbuilt audio recorder as well. Then you're ready. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to start that audio recording. Press the record a second time. Then you'll go ahead and press record on the camera. So this is a neat little trick. You're going to want to start your audio before you start your video. And then when you're done with your recording, you're going to end your video and then finally end your audio. Um, I saw a, uh, someone give this presentation and she had a, a very cute analogy. She said the, the audio recording gives the video recording a hug, right? So the audio recording is going to be a little longer on either end than your video recording. Um, in terms of video converting and editing, so so most of your um, of your cameras are going to record in in all sorts of different file types, MTS, AVC, HD, all these kind of fancy terms. Um, the best uh, file type to edit in, however, is MP4, and so oftentimes you'll need to convert whatever file you pull off your video recording device. Into, um, and there are dedicated softwares that can do this. There are free softwares. Um, Handbrake is one such program. Um, I can send these slides out later on. All of these links are included if you want to go check out these softwares. In terms of post-production editing, there are tons of free options out there. And I've named just a few um, and included their links. There are um, some very fancy professional quality paid options, um, including Adobe Premiere. Sometimes you'll be able to obtain an institutional license um, through an institution with which you're affiliated. So it's definitely worth checking out. Um, some, of these, some of these softwares have a rather steep learning curve, um, but they do allow you to do very professional quality post-production. All right. Um, I want to very quickly dive into some recording techniques that don't rely on this expensive external equipment, right? We have incredibly powerful technology at our fingertips. We're all using perhaps phones or computers right now to join this webinar, and that alone um, will suffice to produce some pretty high quality um, recordings. Uh, so on Zoom, we, are, we live in the era of Zoom recordings, and it is possible to actually get a very high quality um, audio and vid video recording from Zoom by just toggling a few small settings that you might not even have known were there. So high definition recording, um, which means uh, 720 pixels of resolution or higher, is possible with Zoom. Um, but the resolution is very much going to depend on the quality of your internet connection. So you're going to want to make sure you're in a place where you have a very stable, um, high quality internet connection to maintain uh, that, that uh, high resolution recording. If your call involves two people, um, that's perfectly fine. You can go ahead and for free record in high definition. If it has more than two people on the call, you will need a paid account to access that feature. Um, and I'm just going to show you this, delve deep into the settings pages of, of Zoom um, with you. Sorry for my, for my face on the screen there as I was practicing. Um, if you're on Zoom right now, you'll see um, a, a, a sort of a menu bar on the bottom of your screen. Um, and there will be audio and video settings that you can access. Um, if you click the little arrow next to video uh, and click video settings, it'll pull up uh, a screen much like this. Um, and let's check out the video settings first. So right now it's using a built-in camera in my computer and that's perfectly fine. If I wanted to be um, extra sophisticated in my recording techniques, I might attach an external video camera and I'd be able to, uh, to set that preference by just clicking this drop-down menu here. The really relevant point uh, for our purposes is this HD checkbox. So, um, by default, it is unchecked. Um, so you're going to want to go ahead and check that if you are uh, recording um, uh, high quality. Um, and then there's all these other little features that you can make use of. Touching up your appearance is just adjusting the colors and the lighting a little bit. You can adjust for low light. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you about some of the other settings that are here and what they mean. But it's really nice, you know, that that these uh, these options are natively included in the Zoom platform. I certainly didn't know about them until I, I started exploring. 
There's also an audio settings tab, which is extremely useful. I've just shown a, a snapshot of it here. There are more, um, more settings to, to play with, um, but you can use, as I mentioned, an external microphone. And if you do attach an external microphone to your computer, you would change that setting in this drop-down box right here. Um, you can automatically adjust the microphone volume so that um, it, it changes to accommodate the, the speaker's volume level. And that's a really nice way to avoid clipping. Um, so if the speaker suddenly uh, speaks very loudly or laughs loudly, the, the volume will auto adjust to reflect that. Um, and Zoom also provides um, inbuilt background noise suppression. Um, and so the default setting is an auto uh, suppression, but if you, if you like, if you have, for example, a very noisy environment, um, you might wish to, uh, to check the high background noise suppression box, which, um, which does uh, a very good job of filtering out most background noise. But unless you're in a really noisy environment, that might be overkill, that might be unnecessary. Um, and finally, we've got some recording settings. Um, so you can do all sorts of things, um, like specify where you want to save that recording um, on your own hard drive, um, record video during screen sharing, display names. Um, so these are all just things you can play with uh, as, you, as you explore the possibilities of recording with Zoom. Recording with voice memo on your, on your iPhone or other device is another very, very useful technique. This is just for audio recordings, but sometimes um, if you just wanna take a very casual recording, you're sitting and having a conversation, you just put your phone on a table um, near you and your friend as you're chatting, um, this could be a very low stakes method of recording. So you're gonna go ahead to your voice memo app on your iPhone. And it's, it's as easy as just hitting this big red button. Um, and then it will start recording whenever you're speaking, whatever, whatever, it, uh, uh, whatever it hears. You're gonna again, want to abide by the guidelines um, that, I, that I laid out earlier in the presentation in terms of microphone placement, in terms of the, the room uh, and, and um, other sound quality considerations. Um, but in general, this is as, as easy as can be. You'll then click stop to end your recording. Um, and then you'll see your recording here. You'll wanna go and change the file name. If you want to then export that file to let's say a computer for further editing, that's very, very easy to do. Um, you just hit that little, those little three dots on the side of the recording and it'll lead you to a screen that allows you to share that recording. Um, various options will appear. Um, perhaps one of the best options is to email that recording to yourself. So you'll just go ahead and click this email icon um, and then you can type in your own email address. The recording will be included as an attachment. And then in your email is a, is a lovely voice recording um, that you recreate, created with just your own, um, your own iPhone or, or your own recording device. Um, I would again, highly, highly recommend um, if you if you only have a little bit of, of a budget to improve the quality of your recordings, my recommendation would be to purchase um, a cell phone compatible or a smartphone compatible um, external microphone. You can get them for about $50 and it will radically change the quality of your recording. Um, so this is something that plugs directly into your smartphone um, and then you can usually clip it onto um, the speaker's lapel um, and for, for just that $50 investment, it's going to really, really improve the quality. It's pretty, pretty high bang for your buck. So if you are only going to buy one piece of specialized equipment, that would be my recommendation. Finally, in the last five minutes we have here, I want to talk to you a little bit about metadata. Um, as you are creating all of these recordings over the course of your field work, um, you're going to find that very, very quickly they add up. You're gonna you're gonna generate quite a lot of recordings, and uh, you want to make sure that you can keep track of them all, because because very quickly um, it it starts to become uh, a little bit unwieldy with all the files that you'll be having. So making sure to keep track of metadata, which basically means information about the recordings themselves, um, has a number of very uh, very useful useful features. It situates the recording in context um, of, the, of the particular uh, setting in which, in which you've, you've made the recording. 
it makes your recording much, much easier to find at a later date. So if you perhaps recorded hundreds of files and you say, ah, I need to find the one that was recorded under the avocado tree on a Tuesday, um, you'll you'll need some extra information to help you help you tease apart uh, all of the recordings that you've created. And it provides some really crucial information about the contents of those recordings. So some items that you're gonna want to include in your, in your metadata are the names of the speakers involved, the name of the language that you're recording, the date of that recording, the location, um, the names of the elicitors. So that would be you, that would be the, 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 the folks that are, um, are making the recording, setting up all the equipment, asking the questions. Um, the genre of recording, whether it's a, it's a word list elicitation um, or, or storytelling or songs, um, and then just a, a little bit about the general contents of the recording. It's, it's usually a great idea to keep all of this in a spreadsheet where you list the file name and then all of the associated metadata. Um, and that way you'll never have trouble identifying the recording that you're, that you're interested in. File naming conventions are also very important. Um, if you're like me, you will have written a paper at some point where you'll you'll name the file, uh, you know, paper final version, and then you'll go back and you'll edit it again, and then it will become final version for real, and then it will become no, really, I mean it this time, the final version. Um, so to kind of forestall that, uh, you're going to want to have a, a really systematic way of naming your files um, and making sure that the file names themselves include um, useful metadata. Um, so proper naming conventions will give you the who, the when, and the what. Um, and so I've just given a few examples here. My poem dot wave doesn't really tell you much about whose poem it is, when it was recorded. Um, STE001, again, doesn't actually offer that much information. Some good file names, however, provide, let's say the name or the initials of the speaker. They'll also provide the date that the recording was made in some format, the format itself doesn't matter. Um, and then a little blurb or a little bit of information that gives you, uh, gives you some context for what the recording contains. And as always, consistency is key. So once you once you establish a, a naming convention, you're going to want to stick to that naming convention all throughout. Um, ISO codes, you may have encountered these in the course of your language work. Um, they are unique three-letter identifiers that, uh, that identify each of the world's languages, um, and in some cases, various dialects as well. Um, and you can you can look these up at sil.org. You can find the ISO code um, for your particular language. That can be a really valuable piece of information to add to your file name. There's also something called the Glotta code, which is a which is a similar concept. And finally, archiving is absolutely crucial. You know, regardless of how and when and where and using what equipment you collect um, your files, you're going to want to make sure that they are stored for posterity. Um, and so materials that you collect in the field can be uploaded to a variety of institutional archives. Um, at the University of Hawaii, which is my home institution, we have a, an archive called Kaipuleohone, and it has its own metadata conventions and archiving standards. And you can sort of read, uh, read all the instructions for how to upload files to that database. Any archive that you use will have its own standards and instructions and conventions that you'll want to abide by. Um, but that means that now an institution is, um, is accountable for holding onto your data and, and uh, keeping it for posterity. You'll also want to do so on your own end as well. So make sure that you have multiple copies of all of those files um, stored on various hard drives, ideally in multiple locations. Um, stored on the cloud as well. You can, you know, you can never account for hardware failures or um, other sort of catastrophes that that cause loss of data. So you're going to want to have as much redundancy as possible built into your archiving system. So that is it in terms of content from me. But I would love to uh, to entertain any questions that you may have or any comments. Um, and if you have audio or video recording expertise to share, you are so welcome to do so. We would love to love to hear from you as well. So thank you so much.
see some. All right, folks, questions. I have shared your chat questions with Olivia. And if you have questions you would like to ask uh, on video, you can just raise your hand. I'm gonna go ahead and, and address some of these excellent questions in the chat. Um, so one is the, the names of the audio recorders that I showed um, that, uh, in that image. And I can, I can hop back to that page as well. Um, so two of the, of the most commonly used audio recorders are called Tascam, T-A-S-C-A-M, and Zoom audio recorders, Z-O-O-M, just like the, the Zoom software we're using now. Um, and you can find those at really any audio store on Amazon. Um, they're, they're quite, quite widely available. Um, so, so a quick Google search should, uh, should point you in the right direction to those, to those tools. Um, very interesting question. Are there cell phone recording programs that show levels so you can check the volume? I believe there are. Um, I don't know the names of them off the top of my head, but there's a number of different smartphone apps that you can enable on your phone um, that are a little more sophisticated than that, that simple voice memo app that I showed you. Um, and that's a great idea, actually, to, to be able to check for clipping and, and gain levels um, uh, on your smartphone itself. Um, Let's see. Yeah, it's a, there's a really great question that's raised. Um, I'll read it to you. The problem with lighting is it is impossible to manage it in a remote area where there's lack of lighting when important cultural practices are being held. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in all of your recording endeavors, um, making sure to, to prioritize uh, respect for, for the community and for, you know, the, the um, the cultural observances is absolutely paramount um, at all times. And so in that situation, what I would suggest is perhaps um, prior to, uh, to going out into the field would be to, to invest in a camera that has, is optimized for low light conditions. I think that could yield some, some pretty, pretty great dividends in, in your work. Um, Metadata, ah, oh, okay. Metadata softwares, yes. So there are quite a few um, software programs that will help you in collecting and storing and managing all of your metadata. As I mentioned, um, sometimes I go old school and just keep it all in a spreadsheet. Uh, but the software that I have seen used and that is extremely helpful is something called La Meta, um, L-A-M-E-T-A, -E which is a free software. Um, and can be extremely useful uh, just for, for keeping track of all of those metadata items. So that would be my recommendation. Um, great question about ISO versus ISO versus Glotta codes, which are more commonly used. Um, that's a, I'm not sure about more commonly used. I do know that Glotta codes are, um, are perhaps more, uh, are, are more, commonly updated. Anna, I don't know if you if you have um, thoughts about that. I think a lot of codes um, tend to account for for dialectical variations and and you know other sort of nuances that perhaps ISO codes don't account for. Um, yeah, I'd say at this point, ISO codes are more widely used by more organizations and companies and linguists and all that stuff. But I think glotto codes, like Olivia said, are more comprehensive. So some languages may not actually have an ISO code, but they do have a glotto code. And so glottolog is a lot more inclusive of different varieties of languages, and they do update their standard more often. So if it tells you anything, uh, ELP is currently switching from ISO codes to glotto codes. So I don't know which one is still more widely used, but we are moving towards glotto codes here at ELP. That's a, that's great feedback. Thank you, Anna. Um, I see a few more. Oh, um, here's a really interesting one. For achieving more natural speech, do you tend to hide recorders in any way? It's a really interesting question. And I'd again be interested in hearing Anna's thoughts. Um, Folks tend to, myself included, I tend to forget that the recorder's there after a little while. You know, it can be sitting on the on the table right in front of me, and and over time, I just become more more comfortable and and uh, you know start speaking as as though I'm not being recorded. Um, you you know, it is it's not a bad idea to uh, to try to keep it 
in a slightly more discreet location, um, but but you don't want to compromise the quality of your recording. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a of an optimization problem. Anna, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you, Olivia. People tend to get used to the recorder after a little while, but also just we shouldn't have to say it, but don't ever hide the recorder and record someone without their knowledge. Always oh, make that sure is. that they <laughs> know that you are recording. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it, receiving informed consent is also an incredibly important part of the of the recording content, uh, uh, recording process. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up, Anna. Um, and then another question, do you think researchers can depend on AI generated audios regarding accents and spoken language in the face of problems or absence of real life authentic voice data? That's an incredibly interesting question. And especially, you know, as we have all this burgeoning AI technology, which is raising ethical questions and, and procedural questions. Um, I'd love to hear more, more about that question from, from whoever asked it, if you'd, um, if you'd like to hop on. Hi, actually, uh, uh, I, uh, I just posed that question. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, yeah, uh, the, the idea in my mind was that like, um, like these days, a lot of, you know, AI generated things are coming into our lives and our research and our teaching and learning. So uh, my question is that, is there any possibility or uh, is there any kind of uh, way of citing or referencing mm -hmm. of these kind of recordings, which we can use in our research generated by the AI? Absolutely. It's, it's you know, the, the idea of, of or the, the concept of AI in this sort of research is, is so interesting and, and just getting started. Um, I was recently reading about um, uh, the use of AI in, uh, in recordings of sign languages to perform um, auto transcriptions of those sign languages. So based on the movements and the gestures um, to, to be able to translate those into sort of a, a written form. Um, which is absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, I think um, I think the the field is just beginning. I think that a lot of these, the possibilities that you mentioned are are very much in the pipeline. Um, and it will be really interesting to see, you know, AI generated speech and to what extent that maps onto um, to to authentic speech by speakers. I, I think we need to tread a little bit carefully in that domain, right? to make sure that um, as as linguists um, that we are are, are centering our work around around the speakers themselves and their needs and their values. Um, but I, you know, to the extent that that AI can be a useful tool for for making this process more efficient uh, and more beneficial to all, I say you know, utilize it to its maximum extent. There, there Thank may you be so folks much. in this room. Oh, of course. Thank you for your question. There may be folks in the room who are who are more AI savvy than I am. So I welcome you to uh, to chime in. Thanks a lot. I would just add, when using any AI tools for under-resourced languages, be very cautious. Um, AIs tend to fill in gaps with what they think goes there, and it may not have anything to do with how the language actually works. So we've seen a lot of articles and cases recently of AI tools being applied to indigenous or minoritized languages and just coming out with garbage that makes no sense. So be very cautious if you're going to use AI tools. We're still in a phase where they kind of work enough to trick you, but they don't really work that well for a lot of languages. So use what you can, see how it goes, and don't expect it to be 100% accurate at this point in time. That's a fantastic point. Yeah, several grains of salt with, with you know, all sort of, sort of AI generated results. And I think um, to Anna's point, um, a lot of the AI models um, are are based on machine learning algorithms that train on languages such as English, right? So they're they're going to be searching for English-like patterns um, that may or may not exist in the languages you're working on. So yeah, so they can they can they can generate some things that look very authoritative, but are are nevertheless totally wrong. So you want to be a little bit careful. Um, use it as as a tool, but not as a stand-in for linguistic analysis. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, let's see. The synchronization of audio and video. Um, ooh, when the sound of the video is bad. Yeah. So um the this 
the sound of the that's recorded by the video camera is probably not going to be going to be very good unless you attach an external mic, which is why we recommend using an external recording device. And in terms of synchronizing those, there are yeah, there are tons of free softwares, um, and I'd be happy to send out links to all of those um, after the webinar. Um, I'd be very very happy to send a little list. And then we do have a question uh, about, is it conventional to uh, secretly record people by hiding recorders somewhere? Olivia, do you have anything to add? <laughs> Definitely not. No, no, it's it's extremely important to to ensure that um, that all all parties are willingly entering into this into this recording um, relationship. And um, and actually, that that brings me back to um, to a really interesting question that was posed at the beginning, which is sort of um, security of, of data. And, you know, where are these recordings going to be posted? Who's going to have access to them? Um, a lot of times there might be very, very sensitive information that is conveyed in these recordings. And you want to be um, you want to be incredibly cognizant of, of the privilege that you as the recorder have of, of you know, being privy to this information. Um, so it's very important that um, that the, the folks you work with sort of are aware of where those recordings are going to go and who will have access to them. And there are some really interesting platforms coming out now that um, for sort of um, uh, uh, restricted access to information. So the one that comes to mind for me is a, is a, um, a site called Mukutu, M-U-K-U-R-T-U, and I can send that out. Um, where uh, based on your um, your how you identify within the community as as an elder, your gender, whatever it happens to be, um, you may or may not have access to to different uh, different items in that archive, and that can all be be stipulated by the community who has access to what, um, and so access is restricted based on your demographics in accordance with community wishes. So um, so there's there are people giving thought to this about you know you've made your recordings. You know, we we often think that broad dissemination is is the best possible outcome of these recordings, but that's not always the case. And it's really important to to confirm with your um, with your speakers and your subjects um, what they're comfortable with in terms of dissemination. Okay, security problems uh, with online recordings. Oh, that's an interesting question. I have not encountered, um, to my knowledge, any any security issues with recording online. Anna, is that something you you run into? Yeah. So I think, unfortunately, a good rule of thumb whenever you are doing any kind of language work is if you are using the internet to do something, there is a possibility that someone will be able to access it, especially depending on what country you live in, uh, what the context is like. If you know your government wanted to access your Zoom call, they probably could, unless you have a whole lot of digital security skills. So be mindful, just, you know, <laughs> so most people don't have any interest in the language recordings you are doing, but, just always assume there is some kind of possibility that what you're doing could be accessed by someone else if you're doing it online. And if you're really worried about keeping your recordings secure, uh, do it in person with uh, an audio recorder that is not a cell phone. But again, in most contexts, most governments or police or whatever don't have very much interest in your language work. So I wouldn't worry about it a lot. Mm, great point about network instability. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a big one. Any other questions? Well, I see this one about uh, is AI having any effect on the way language documentation is done nowadays? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's you know that's a it's a great question. Um, I think AI has yet to um, to to reach a point at which it's it's really um, viable for for lesser spoken or lesser studied languages um, uh, simply because of the absence of of data. Um, but I think we're I think we're reaching that point. Um, I think 
uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in um, developing uh, developing tools that will take a stream of recorded sound and automatically transcribe that, say, in IPA, right? So that you can you can get past what we call the transcription bottleneck in linguistics, where it, you record all this amazing data, but then you have to sit down and transcribe it on IPA, and it takes you know an hour to do five minutes. Uh, and so certainly AI can can go a long way in just making our our protocols more efficient. I think, um, and so those are those are things that are certainly in the works. Yeah, we'll have to learn a lot of orthography, that's true. And AI can also be useful in managing your files, right? If you have developed some sort of system for naming your audio files, I think there are AI tools that can just look at the file information and then rename all of it like, okay, I know that this file was recorded on this date at this time. And if it's on your phone, maybe this location. So you can just automatically rename all of your files using that convention, using an AI tool. It's a tiny, tiny bit of help. Oh, but that could save so much time. No, you're so right. Yeah, really any any process that, that you can automate, um, you know, so you can maximize the attention that you're focusing on on, on speakers and on, on working with those, those really interesting facets of language. Yeah, use, use AI to your advantage. Oh, Anna, I might I might give this question to you. It's it's such a great question um, about uh, paying speakers for for recordings and sort of the, the mechanics and ethics of of um, remuneration. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah, thanks for this question, Pius. I suspect this is a slightly rhetorical question given <laughs> given your public speaking about this topic in the past. But personally. It depends on the context that you're working in, right? There might be times when it's not polite or even disrespectful to offer to pay someone for sharing language with you. There are also lots of cases where it's really respectful and really good to compensate people for their time because they're they're taking time out of their day to talk with you, to make this recording. Uh, maybe they've traveled to meet with you. So I generally prefer to pay people rates comparable to what like, I don't know, a school teacher makes in the area because that's what folks are doing. They're teaching you. Um, if there isn't any funding, then it's up to you to have a conversation with the folks you're working with about what they think is fair and respectful and shows reciprocity, even if it's not giving them money directly. Maybe, you know, you can go help with some project they're doing at their home that weekend in exchange for their time recording with you. It doesn't have to be money necessarily, but make sure you find ways that people are getting as much out of this relationship as you are, right? You're getting language data. What are they getting in return? Even if it's not like cash, find some way that it can be something that they get out of working with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, yeah. Context and communication are, are really the keys there. Yeah. What would you say, Pius? I'm sure you have advice for people. Yeah, I, actually, you, you, I think you said it. You said it uh, in a in a very nice way, Anna. Uh, I just wanted to probably find a way for this point to go through that. You know, we should recognize that people have. You know, this is this is a resource that people have the ability to speak a language and we should not just take it for granted mm -hmm. so that even if there is no funding, as you say, one should find ways to show gratitude for, for getting all that information from people. So I think you've said it the best way one could ever say. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Pius. And I will remind everyone here that if you would like other good advice on your language work, Dr. Payasukumbu is a highly regarded documentary linguist who is able to talk with you for free through the ELP Revitalization Mentors Program. So I will put a link in the chat to make a free appointment to talk with Pius. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Yeah. I see a question in the chat from Sirama and then, and then um, uh, a couple raised hands as well. Um, there's a there's a question about um, capturing yeah best practices when there are you know child's voices and other chaotic situations that you that you can't control for which is per 
perfectly all right and very common. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, it's important to include um, the, the context of the recording and you, you don't necessarily want to, uh, to eliminate all of that, that background information. I guess my suggestion for getting the highest quality audio there would be, um, to be, to be cognizant of, of the microphone that you're using. And if you're, if you're really keen on capturing just a single voice, um, think about those, those directionality patterns, right. And, and try to get a unidirectional microphone or um, a microphone that clips uh, a so-called lapel microphone that, that can capture just that really, you know, uh, uh, narrow stream of speech. Uh, so just, you know, giving a little bit of prior thought to your recording equipment um, can, can go a long way. So I see um, Vipin and, and Fias, Vipin first. Yes, hi, am I audible? Yes, you are. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the session. There are a lot of like these little things that you know uh, that would not have crossed my mind that I had to make a note of. Um, but I just want to know: uh, it, can you give us like some very like not not I know you probably won't be able to share like real language data, but you know you explained us to the uh, us the importance of like how to you know the importance of gain and you know clipping and all that. But if you could give us like certain examples where not having these settings in their optimal condition could like, you know, miss out certain sounds in the language, like maybe like a click or a glottal stop that, you know, so it, it just would help us, like it help, it would help for us to understand um, why exactly these settings are important, right? Like on paper, you can see, okay, you need to set gain and you need to do all of that. But I, I guess it would help if, if we have like an, like a very specific example where it will tell us like you know if you don't do this this is how you'll mess up right um if you can <laughs> yeah. tell us something like that thank you so much of course i mean i would be happy to uh, after this webinar send out um a few a few links or a few a few little files um i, I think there's a google drive uh that that show you sort of what can go wrong in audio recordings um it, with clipping specifically um once you reach that red zone what you've basically done is the you have exceeded the microphone's sensitivity um and so any anything else will will be perceived as just kind of this sort of like popping roaring sound um and it will obscure it will obscure the rest of your of that portion of your recording. But um, Vipin, I agree with you. I think just uh, seeing it in action and hearing some of these examples is probably is probably the best way to internalize it. And so I can um, prepare some examples for you all. I think um, I think Baez had a hand. Um, my question was about, uh, I think you have already partially answered that about the, uh, you know, the sounds in the environment. My, my question was particularly about like, in South Asian countries like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh and like in that region, the cities are not planned. Mm -hmm. So we have like within residential areas, we have like businesses which which create a lot of noise, even at the dead of the night. So like we, we, we can hear like uh, dogs barking or machines working or welders working in there. So in these settings, what has been your experience? As you have explained that you have worked in Assam, could you please share some of your experiences? Absolutely. Um, yes, so I, I totally agree with you that that's been that's been my experience as well. And, and as I mentioned before, you know, sometimes it's it's a it's an asset as to the ambiance and and you know the, the understanding of the of the the setting. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I, I try to use directional microphones to um, to uh, uh, to sort of correct for that. I also, you know, making sure you're in an enclosed space can be really helpful. Um, the filtering out of background noise is is important. As as I mentioned, I would not do this um, uh, beforehand. By which I mean that sometimes your audio recording itself or your computer will have a built-in background filter setting, and I would not use that. Um, and the reason is that you want to record things with as high fidelity as possible so that you have a really faithful copy and then you can sort of mess with it and change it at the end. Um, but this is where that uh, room tone comes into play. So that 30 seconds of sort of silent audio where no one's speaking and you're just collecting sort of the ambient sounds. So maybe you'll hear, you know, rumbling traffic in the background. If you can collect that, then you sort of have data that shows you, ah, here's what here's what the, the waveform for that rumbling traffic looks like. 
And then in an audio processing software um, later on, you can actually filter out those exact frequencies from the, from the file um, so that throughout your entire audio recording, you've now removed that traffic noise. And so this is good for, um, for sort of noises that are more sustained, I would say, um, you know, for things like kids or, or, uh, or um, you know, the occasional honk of, of traffic, you know, these are things you can't control for and that's totally all right. You know, your, 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 your job here is to, is to just make sure that you're faithfully capturing language data. So as long as it's audible um, and, and parsable, um, you know, the other things are just, are just sort of gravy. So I wouldn't worry too much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your question. I have seen some interesting projects to build cheap, easily portable recording booths, like a little, a little soundproof recording booth you can take with you when you travel. Oh, I don't wow. think they're available commercially yet. I know that there were some people working on this as like a hobby. So if those become commercially available or they put out a blueprint for making a cheap little recording booth, I will share that as well. <laughs> I have seen people using umbrellas, so you know they'll they'll actually open up an umbrella and kind of get under it. And you create this sort of sort of enclosed space uh, to capture those sound waves. So there's there's and closets, cars, right? There there are various small spaces you can use to try to optimize the sound. Oh, Laura, I want to echo your your statement. Always keep copies of your original recordings. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna end up editing them, but you never know when you'll you know you want to go back to that original. So, um, yes, highly highly recommended. I see a hand from is it Iona? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Um, I have a question about the management of data afterwards. So if you work, for example, affiliated with the university, uh, is it the elicitor, the recorder who judges the quality of a recording and if it's uh, good to keep it uh, or not? Or is it someone else from the university or someone else, I don't know, external who can judge the quality and tell the recorder Okay, this recording is not really good. We have to redo it, or we cannot. Uh, we don't have the chance to redo it, so we have to throw it away. It's an excellent Thank question. You. I'm actually going to defer to Anna on that one um, because I, you know, I've only just started uploading my files to various archives. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it really depends on your archive and sort of the perspective of the people running it. Uh, at Kaipuleohone, the University of Hawaii archive, it's a very field work oriented archive. And so they understand that you're not always gonna get perfect audio quality. Uh, sometimes you have a noisy or, or sort of muted recording and that's fine. They don't generally judge based on audio quality as to whether it goes in the archive. I think the only thing that would keep a recording out of the archive is if it were recorded unethically or you know there were some other really big issue with how it was made. Uh, I don't know how it might be at your university. I would recommend contacting whoever runs the archive. Archivists are usually very excited to talk about their archival practices. So just ask. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Interesting question about zooming in and out while recording. Um, I think. I think it's contextual. You're right um, that that there can be circumstances where where maybe zooming in might be appropriate on perhaps uh, something that the the speaker is doing with their hands, or or um, if you just want to get you know a really close up shot. I think that should be used somewhat sparingly, however, because um, that the process of adjustment can kind of can kind of shift your your settings a little bit, make things a little bit unstable. Um, then maybe you're focusing more on getting you know this sort of perfect video footage than than on the the sort of the language that's uh, that's that's being collected, um, and also you you know that sort of wide shot is very deliberately um, intended to to capture as much of the speaker and their surroundings as possible while still while still honing in on the important things. So. Um, my my advice, I think, would be to to use that feature sparingly, right? We we are um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are, are expert videographers, but we're not we're not making a documentary, so to speak, necessarily. Maybe maybe you are, and that, that would be amazing too. But if it's just purely for language data, you know that that sort of consistency and 
um, and stability is is really important. Um, although, Anna, do you have do you have other thoughts about that? No, I agree. I don't know if you also were trained in this, but I had a professor who would just tell us, you're not making an action movie. You're not trying to be flashy here. You just That's want exactly to capture what's happening. happening. Yes. <laughs> yes. So exactly. uh, it depends on your individual goals. If you're yeah, trying to make true. something really entertaining that people in your community will watch for fun, go for it, get creative. But I'll if you're just trying to record language data that you can use later, try and keep it pretty steady. This is such a great point. Anthony. Oh, hi, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. Um, it's just a question, a technical question about, you are talking about Zoom earlier. And mm -hmm. um, I've, um, I've noticed the, the free part, if you don't have a membership or if you don't pay a license, you're limited to 40 minutes for recording. Is there a way to make that longer or is it just, just 40 minutes? Oof. I, you know, I bumped into this. Um, so what I did when I encountered this issue was um, I was able to obtain uh, uh, access through my institution. Um, and so now I have, uh, I didn't have to pay anything and I have sort of the, the uh, higher tier of, of Zoom access where I can, I can record unlimited amounts. Um, you know, beyond that, uh, you know, I just sort of made do with 39 minute increments, right? You just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of do your best. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know all that much about Zoom policies, Anna. Is that I'm sorry to keep throwing to you, but is, do you, are you aware of the other <laughs> extenuating circumstances? I think the unfortunate answer is yeah. You you get forty minutes for free. They may have uh, if you have a registered nonprofit organization yes. that you're affiliated with. I think they do offer nonprofit licenses at a big discount or maybe free. So look into that. But otherwise, like Olivia said, just make. 35 minute chunks and restart the call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you kind of have to have to cobble together these sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. For yeah, of course, that. Anthony. Thanks for your question. Mm, audacity is excellent yeah i can i can send out a link audacity is one of my favorite i should have mentioned it one of my favorite um uh audio editing softwares it's free it has sort of a very intuitive uh feel when you first get started it's also very powerful it has you know uh hidden hidden uh, features that i haven't even begun to explore um but yes i do most of my audio processing in audacity and i will happily send out the link afterwards oh and I just sent it. Yeah, there are lots of great softwares out there for editing your video and audio data. Some of them can be challenging to get started in, but with a little bit of practice, once you've done a few edits, you'll be amazed at how fast it starts to go and how intuitive it becomes. So if there's a lot of interest in Audacity training, send me an email and I'll see if we can find a volunteer from ELP to lead a little mini Audacity tutorial because it's a super useful software. Oh, Gail, yeah, Gail makes a really good point about um you know, recording, zooming in on on the mouth and the and the tongue as you're as you're recording, so that you can get more uh, more concrete sort of phonetic data. That's that's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, that's a great point, Gail. There there is a good reason to zoom in yes. sometimes if you want <laughs> to really show what somebody's mouth is doing. Training for video editing. Yes, that's a great point. Um, we have had some internal trainings at ELP for video editing. Let me see if we have a re recording of any of those, but it would be nice to just have a basic video editing session. So uh, thanks. I will put that on the schedule for sort of extra optional sessions if y'all are interested.
All right. Any other questions for Olivia about recording? All right, Olivia, you answered every single possible question. <laughs> Good job. I'm, I'm happy. Please, please feel free to reach out um, by by email. I'll paste it in the chat um, if I can if I can help in any way or answer other questions or just direct you to someone who knows more than I am. I do, which is most people. Um, here's my email um, in the chat. It was great talking to you all. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. So join us next week. We're going to get into some linguistic-y linguistic stuff. We're going to start talking about phonology, which is a fancy term for the system of sounds in your language. And we're going to talk a little bit about orthography or writing systems for writing down all those sounds in your language. So we'll see you next week. Same time, same Zoom link. And if you have any questions in the meantime, please reach out to Olivia or me. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. Take care.